Did you know at one time, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi were actually one country? In this video, we'll find out why. But before we do that, if you like the content on this channel, please consider partnering with me on Patreon. From as little as $3, you can help me improve the quality and consistency of videos on this channel. On that note, help me thank my biggest Patreon, Tom Bodkin. Thank you so much for the continued support. If you follow my channel, you're already familiar with how the nation of Zimbabwe was colonized by Cecil John Rhodes and his British South Africa company. I'll leave a cut above if you haven't watched the video. In Malawi, the process began a little bit earlier when David Livingstone arrived there in 1859, but the country would officially be recognized as the Nyasaland District's Protectorate later on in 1891, then the British Central African Protectorate from 1893. It would officially be referred to as Nyasaland from 1907. Zambia, just like Zimbabwe, was occupied in 1888 through dubious treaties signed with local African tribes under the orchestration of Cecil John Rhodes. With great assistance from Coilard and DuPont, the British South Africa Company was able to take over the whole of Zambia by the end of the 19th century. By 1911, the western and eastern parts of modern-day Zambia were joined together to form the Protectorate of Northern Rhodesia, with its capital at Livingston. The British South Africa Company used pretty much the same template in all its occupied territories, which included driving the Africans into unproductive land known as the reserves, heavy taxation, violence, and forced labor. As a way to push Africans out of subsistence farming in northern Rhodesia, the British South Africa Company imposed a hard tax, which was payable only in cash. This obviously did not go down well with the locals, who would have their property destroyed as well as face imprisonment if and when they failed to pay. In Nyasaland, modern-day Malawi, similar revolts took place. For example, in January 1915, John Chilembwe, a millenarian pastor in southeastern Nyasaland, led an unsuccessful revolt known as the Chilembwe uprising against British rule. Just like in northern Rhodesia, Chilembwe opposed the recruitment of Nyasas in the British Army's campaign in East Africa, as well as a system of colonial rule. As a form of resistance, Chilembwe's followers attacked local plantations, but were soon defeated by the British forces. Chilembwe was killed and many of his followers were executed. Southern Rhodesia had experienced similar revolts earlier in 1896 in what would come to be known as the First Chimurenga. Company rule ended in southern Rhodesia in 1923 when the white settlers were granted responsible government. And in northern Rhodesia, it ended in 1924 when the British colonial office assumed control. But the British South Africa Company retained their commercial assets. Under colonial rule, north and southern Rhodesia, as well as Nyasaland, undertook major infrastructure projects. Roads, and railways were built and the cultivation of cash crops by European settlers was introduced. This growth was, however, mainly for serving colonial interests. Many African men from northern Rhodesia and Nyasaland ended up migrating to southern Rhodesia and South Africa to seek employment opportunities. This explains why to this day there's a considerable amount of people of Malawian and Zambian descent living in South Africa and Zimbabwe. For the colonial government, Zambia and Malawi were seen as a source for cheap labor and minerals. Many white folks preferred southern Rhodesia and South Africa. That is why to this day the European community in Malawi and Zambia is small. The capital city of Zambia was transferred to the more central Lusaka in 1935. A legislative council was established of which five members were elected by the small European minority of only 4,000 people but none by the African population. In 1928 enormous copper deposits were discovered in the region which then became known as the Copper Belt, transforming northern Rhodesia from a prospective land of colonization for white farmers to a copper exporter. By 1938, the country produced 13% of the world's copper extraction. Working conditions for the Africans were very poor and risky. In addition to hefty taxes they had to pay, this culminated in the copper belt strike by African mine workers in 1935, which led to the killing of six mine workers by the authorities. Plans to combine the territories of Nyasaland and North and Southern Rhodesia were discussed as far back as the 1920s. In 1929, the Hilton Young Commission concluded that the main interests of Nyasaland and Northern Rhodesia, economic and political, lie not in the association with the East African territories, but rather one another and with the self-governing colony of Southern Rhodesia. In 1938, the Bladys Law Commission concluded that the territories would become independent in all their activities. It also advocated for the creation of an interterritorial 
Territorial Council to coordinate government services and survey the development needs of the region. All these plans were briefly shelved when the world was plunged into the Second World War. In 1945, the Central African Council was established to promote coordination of policy and action between the territories. The governor of Southern Rhodesia presided over the council and was joined by the leaders of other two territories. The council only had consultative and not binding powers. The Second World War brought with it somewhat of a political awakening in Africans. In 1944, the Nyasaland African Congress was formed, inspired by the African National Congress Peace Charter of 1914. The Nyasaland African Congress soon spread across Southern Africa, with powerful branches emerging among migrant workers working in Salisbury, which is now Harare, in Southern Rhodesia, and in Lusaka in Northern Rhodesia. In 1950, Jim Griffiths, the Secretary of State for the Colonies, informed the House of Commons that the government had decided that there should be another examination of the possibility of a closer union between Central African territories and that a conference of the respective governments and the Central African Council was being arranged for March 1951. The conference concluded that there was a need for a closer association pointing to the economic interdependence of the three territories. It was argued that individually the territories were vulnerable and would benefit from becoming a single unit with a more broadly based economy. Another conference was held in September 1951 at Victoria Falls, also attended by Griffiths and Patrick Gordon Walker. Another two conferences would be held in London in 1952 and in 1953 respectively, where the federal structure was prepared in detail. Southern Rhodesia proved to be the biggest impediment to the talks. Southern Rhodesia and Northern Territories had very different traditions for the native question and the roles they were designed to play in civil society. Basically, Southern Rhodesia was not ready to give Africans the sort of liberties that Africans up north were getting. Sir Andrew Cohen, Colonial Office Assistant under Secretary for African Affairs, was instrumental behind the creation of the Federation, often resolving conflicts among parties. The House of Commons approved the conference's proposal on 24 March 19. And in April, passed motions in favor of federating the territories of Northern Rhodesia and Nyasaland. A referendum was held in Southern Rhodesia on the 9th of April. More than 25,000 white Southern Rhodesians voted in the referendum for a federal government versus nearly 15,000 against. The majority of Africaners and Black Africans in all the three territories were resolutely against it. The federation came into being when the Parliament of the United Kingdom enacted the Rhodesia and Nyasaland Federation Act of 1953. It was commonly understood that Southern Rhodesia would be the dominant territory in the Federation, economically, electorally, and militarily. Scholars believe that the only reason why Southern Rhodesia joined the Federation was to have access to the vast copper deposits in Zambia. The Federation was a huge success economically, especially for Southern Rhodesia. During the Federation, huge projects like the building of the Kariba Dam was achieved. I'll leave a cut above if you haven't watched my video on the history of Kariba. In the first year of the Federation, its GDP was 300 150 million pounds. Two years later, it was nearly 450 million pounds. In the late 1950s, Africans protested against white minority rule in the Central African Federation. In 1958, Hastings Banda, the leader of the Nyasaland African Congress, which later became the Malawi Congress Party, returned from Great Britain to Nyasaland. In October of the same year, Kenneth Kaunda became the leader of the Zambian African National Congress, a split from the Northern Rhodesian ANC. This increasingly rattled the Central African Federation authorities, who eventually banned the Zambian African National Congress in March 1959, and in June imprisoned Kaunda for nine months. While Kaunda was in jail, his loyal lieutenant, Mainza Chona, worked with other African nationalists to create the United National Independence Party, UNIP, a successor to the Zambian African National Congress. In early 1959, unrest broke out in Nyasaland. The Central African Federation government declared a state of emergency. Dr. Banda and and the rest of the Nyasaland African Congress leadership were arrested and their party outlawed. Southern Rhodesian troops were deployed to bring order. Britain was growing uneasy over the rights of Africans. Many European countries were letting go of their colonies. African nationalism was gaining traction on the continent. Nations like Ghana had gained independence in 1957. In 1963, the Victoria Force Conference was held, partly as a last-ditch effort to save the Central African Federation and partly as a forum to dissolve it. After nearly collapsing several times, it ended on 5 July 1963, and the state was virtually dissolved. Only the appropriation of its assets remained as a formality. 
By 31 December, the Federation of Rhodesia in Nyasaland was formally dissolved and its assets distributed among the territorial governments. Southern Rhodesia obtained the vast majority of these, including the assets of the Federal Army, to which it had overwhelmingly contributed. Earlier in the same year, in July 1964, the Nyasaland Protectorate became independent as Malawi, led by Hastings Banda. In October 1964, Northern Rhodesia gained independence as the Republic of Zambia, obtaining majority rule led by Kenneth Kaunda. Southern Rhodesia, on the other hand, was not ready to give power to the Africans. On the 11th of November 1965, Southern Rhodesia's government, led by Prime Minister Ian Smith, proclaimed the Unilateral Declaration of Independence, UDI, from the United Kingdom. This attracted the world's attention and created outrage in Britain. If that's a video you'd like me to work on, let me know in the comments below. That, in a nutshell, is how Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi were at one time one country. See you in the next video.